different fields to get introduced by themselves. And then we will start the debate about the topic that we will take today. My name is Andreu, Andreu Bea. I am the president of the Internet Society in Spain. And I had been for more than 20 years. Uh, my, my business card has been always the word Internet. So I, am, uh, I try to be an Internet guy. And I like that this Internet is really changing all the world and all the markets and everything. <clears throat> Let's make a first uh, quick uh, round of presentations, of introductions. George, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes. Uh, my name is Georg Serenci. Um, I'm in charge of uh, regulation for Austria. And on top of that, I'm the chairman of BEREC, that's the so to say, umbrella organization of the European regulators. Great. And, and what, what's, to be a little longer, uh, what's, uh, what do you do normally? Your normal... It's, it's because then it's important to know uh, what we are doing in our normal uh, business and jobs, because then you will see how, depending on each one person, uh, the contributions to the debate will be in a different perspective, right? So, of, of course. Uh, well, um, I mean, the job of a regulator is to take care about competition in a specific sector. So that means uh, to check whether the, there is a level playing field between uh, the operators, the service providers in a certain market, uh, to settle disputes between those operators, to make market analysis according uh, to the framework provided by the European Commission. Uh, to run dispute settlement with end customers and a couple of other things which are coming on top normally. And as for the work for BEREC, the, the, the body of European regulators of electronic communications, uh, the, the, it's, ma it's mainly three, t it's three different jobs. Uh, one is uh, to, uh, to harmonize the work between the 27 national regulators. Uh, the second is to come up with an opinion in case there is a dispute between uh, the European Commission and the national regulator. And the third one, which is, I think, very important, uh, is to act as an advisor to the European institutions uh, in our sector. Okay. Next, in my right, uh, is Glenn. Glenn, can I introduce you, yourself? Introduce myself, yeah. So, uh, my name is Glenn Manoff. Uh, I work at uh, Telefonica, O2. Um, I, I look after a number of things, but you'll see some branding around the place uh, called Think Big, including on my sweatshirt, and that's part of the, some of the programs I lead in something called social business, which is taking what we do as a business uh, and thinking not simply about uh, simple commercial return, but social return, which is good for society, but good for us as well. So some of the things you've seen are our, our partnership with Futura, that's Rollout Campus Party, uh, Waira, which you may have seen. Uh, so taking a more socially oriented approach, um, that's a win-win for us in society. Uh, and I could talk more about that in some of the programs uh, or in some of the discussion that we have. Um, the, 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 I guess the core thought is it makes us a stronger business and it makes society stronger and a lot of evidence to show that. My background, I'm not a technologist, so my, my, my approach is much more social, public policy. Uh, I, I come from a public policy background, also in uh, journalism. So I came, uh, I'm, a, I'm an American, but I've been in Europe for about uh, 18 years. And I was writing about all of this stuff, the internet. I was writing about you, Paul, back in the mid-90s when I was uh, editing something called Communications Week International, writing about the internet, writing about uh, networks, networked economies. And uh, I've reflected a lot back on that period of my life as I thought about kind of this question and also just the interesting writing about some of the people back then that I'm sitting on the panel with. And, and what do you do normally in your job? It's, uh, what's, what's your responsibility? Yeah, point? So a lot of people ask me that because my, my job is, uh, is a new one within our company. But I think my job is to help us look at how we can drive the transformation of Telefonica uh, to a more uh, a new economy company, so a digitally minded company. We're, uh, we're a telco and need to change very quickly from being a telco to being a digital services company. Otherwise, we will quickly become uh, become irrelevant. We'll become a, a pipe, but little else. Uh, and, and we try to do that through 
the way we reach out in, into other networks. So again, by uh, by putting together programs which help us bring digital technology into the company, bring young people into the company. Talentum, which we've seen over here, hiring thousands of, uh, of young people with digital skills. And if you're interested, you can sign up uh, and find out more about roles, apprenticeships, uh, things like that, full-time roles at Telefonica, our youth programs, our investment programs and digital startups, all to help us move much, much more quickly uh, to become a more digitally innovative company. That's great. And um, uh, in the far right, we have uh, Paul, Paul Moka Betris. He's the inventor of the DNS. And introduce yourself, Paul, a little bit. Sure. I'm Paul Moka Petris. I'm the uh, chairman and chief scientist of a company called Nominum. And what we do there is to d deliver DNS software, which carriers such as Telefonic in turn use so that when you type a web address, you actually go there. Um, I've been, I'm sort of a technologist, I guess, um, although it seems to me that increasingly the technological possibilities for interconnecting. Can it? Yes, if you can be still on I think test it. Oh. I'm sorry, it's not working. So you get a microphone. The technology is, exists to interconnect all of that vast amount of data that's been collected and use it in a number of new and interesting ways. I think the, the problem that we face as a society is we have data that's going from one place to another that we are not sure we, we want to have go. Um, so we have problems like piracy. And then there's other questions about people are collecting data about you that you don't even know exists. Um, and you would certainly like to at least know it exists and maybe argue that it shouldn't be there. So the technology has given us the possibility to interconnect almost everything and it's also given us the ability to put some walls in place that prevent people from finding out what's going on. So a lot of what I think the problems for society are is figuring out which interconnections should exist and which ones should not and how you shape that in a way that is a reasonable compromise between privacy and security and the other issues. Perfect. And, and what's your normal job? What, what are you doing right now? It's not that. Well, right now I'm on a sabbatical at the University of Pierre Marie Curie in Paris, thinking about content-centric networking, um, which is yet another example. The research community uh, at NSF and increasingly in Europe is looking for new paradigms for content distribution. But as one commercial representative to our consortia said, we're looking for innovative business models as long as they don't dis disrupt the business model of the content pr producer, the content consumer, or the carrier, <laughs> which <laughs> doesn't leave much room to operate. But you know, the whole notion of content-centric networking says that content should be cached opportunistically um, all over the network, and that you know, you think about ways of doing security that protects the content, but at the same time would prevent people from actually seeing what's in it and digital rights management and so forth. So, you know, the real question here is trying to figure out what we want out of this world. Great. Now, let's, uh, now that you know a little bit more about us, let's talk, uh, I would like uh, at the end to, to, to start a, a global conversation with all of you about the thing that uh, we are talking always that uh, the internet has reached around 2 billion, 2,000 million people already of users, more or less. But guess what? We are 7, million, 7 billion people in the world. What, what are we going to do with these next 5 billion people? And is it mm, good to expect that we could reach them or there is a lack of electricity or a lack of whatever. There is always something that I think that is the next revolution will be the voice over IP. 
in, in like 1990s, uh, well, what happened? That email was the, the driver for, for connecting it. It was cheaper than a fax or whatever. I mean, the, ma the massification of that. And now I think the voice over IP, uh, because when you use a computer mm, in the world, not everybody, you need to read and how, know how to read and how to write. Not everybody does that. But everybody speaks, okay? So I was thinking, this is a theory that they have, but you can discuss about it, that voice over IP will be the next driver to get all the people together. But then, what's the, what are the stoppers? Probably the price, and not, not in developed countries, but in, uh, in other countries, internet is still expensive. And let's, let's talk a little bit, because we are talking about that this internet will bring the people together. But in some cases, it's not like that. Which are the stoppers, do you think, to reach this, I would say, can we plan or think about that in the future we will have all the humanity connected all together? What do you think? If you want to just uh, intervene whenever you want yes. or just make a round? Or as, you, as you like. But I'm, I'm pretty convinced that uh, ubiquitous access to the internet uh, will become a human right once and uh, what means for everybody at every place anytime and there is a lot to do to get to that point because uh, it requires first that there is physically or technically the access to the internet possible whether through uh, mobile technologies or through some wirings and um, that, that needs a lot of money because uh, these networks need to be rolled out. Uh, th there are a couple of regulatory issues when it comes to that point. So it is the supply side which needs to be developed and uh, there is still a lot to do as you mentioned. But we have a demand side as well. And what we see though is um, even in the very developed areas uh, we have not everybody on the internet, although there is technically the possibility, which means we have to do something on the demand side to enable users uh, to improve illiteracy, uh, the fourth cultural technique, so to say, besides reading, writing and making calculations. So that is important and uh, it is, uh, in, in the political debate it is very often overlooked um, that um, the supply side is important, but it but it's not enough. So, and when it comes to the to the demand side, also the whole issues around net neutrality becomes very important. But maybe we can uh, discuss it a little bit uh, later. I guess the, the 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 comment I would make is is I've been in uh, the carrier side for about ten years, and before that, writing about it, and I think for all that time. We've always talked about the technology and rolling out and building networks. We've been very focused on it in Europe. We've built multiple networks in each country um, and multiple technologies. I, I don't think any longer, and this is an oversimplification, I know, but I, I don't think the issue is technology. I think there's a cornucopia of technologies that, that exist, and the mix will be you know, different technologies for different circumstances, and, and it'll be mobile technology, some fix, some Wi-Fi, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, and I don't think it's so much an issue of, of there's a certain image of people in the developing world living very, very remotely um, in very poor regions and having to be connected because there's a huge opportunity and challenge there. But uh, I think as you said, there, there are the next billion are probably living in cities today uh, and the next billion uh, already have mobile phones. So this year we will pass the point by the end of this year when there are more connected mobile devices than people on Earth. So we will hit 6.8, 6.9 billion connected mobile phones or mobile devices this year active. And depending on which estimates you look at, by 2020, anywhere from 20 to 50 billion connected devices. Uh, and some of these will be machine to machine, some of this will be the internet of things. But, you know, that th there's an infrastructure that's being created uh, and a cost reduction that's coming with it. That means that technology is no longer the barrier. I, I agree that, that it's on the demand side and some of the economic systems that we have. But as the cost comes down and as, the, as mobile devices ship that are internet capable, 
and over the next couple of years, the vast majority, and over the next five years, all devices that ship will be internet capable, and the cost of networks is coming down because of scale economies, because of all these connected devices. Uh, I think the next billion will come much, much more quickly than the first billion. Where we should be focusing is uh, on the economic divide, those who are, are excluded uh, for economic reasons, but uh, there, are, there are huge numbers that are already connected, huge numbers, and they have access to networks today. Yeah, I tend, to, I tend to agree that we have the technology, at least in the first and second world. I'm not sure what the second world is exactly, but I'd say the first and second world. Uh, you know, the technology already exists for interconnection. I think that in that space, the, the, the problem is more about trying to figure out how the economics and the policy issues um, that are there. Because while the technology is there, somebody has to pay for it. And, uh, you know, in any marketplace, there's a bid and an ask price, and you have to figure out where the sale actually happens. So, you know, there's, it's pretty clear to me that the one place where I like the U.S. from a standpoint of Internet access is I can go anywhere in the U.S. and my mobile phone behaves the same. Whereas here I can step across the, the, the border from... France into Spain and for about three miles my phone still works and then all of a sudden it's different because there's this sort of different policies and national boundaries around what we in the United States would think relatively small areas and so you know does the human right to communicate does it go away when I cross a border I'm kind of curious uh, because you know there's there's I carry two SIM cards. I guess I would have you to have universal connectivity. I would have to carry four or five and a an occasional new spare. Is that ever going to change? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it will change, and I, I think it is changing. I think one of the things that's changing uh, and, and that will drive this is we, we used to compete based on networks, and the reason as you go across borders is Europe is an area roughly the size of. Uh, of the U.S. and we have some hundreds of different networks, uh, whereas there's roughly two or three in the states, and, and they're inter you know they've been patched together, and is very interoperable. Uh, that doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, we used to think that building more networks would create more choice for consumers, and I think now uh, I think we, we've long since realized that building more networks doesn't create more choice for consumers. What creates more choice for consumers is service-led innovation, uh, and realistically. I don't know what that was. That was interesting. So realistically, you could have one network, right? And we're moving towards that. So uh, I mean, our biggest rival in, in Europe, Telefonica, is Vodafone. We're now building networks together because the logic of building two and not one uh, isn't there because we will then lay services on top. And I think that that will make the interconnection of all these different networks and all the handoffs much simpler as the idea that lots of networks means lots of choice for consumers goes away and choices about how you innovate on top of that platform. That also drives costs down because the cost of the consumer is the cost of the consumer is born uh, once rather than these multi-billion pound networks or euro networks being built again and again and then and then laying idle. Yeah. I, I would like to briefly comment on, on the, the value of having a couple of networks because uh, it turned out uh, in the last 15 years of the, so to say, history of competition between networks in Europe that facility-based competition uh, became the most powerful tool for, uh, for providing the customer superior service and at the same time giving incentives for building out these networks and improving those networks. And so the interesting thing is, if you look at the future, um, I mean, the single di digital market in Europe is a big political goal. How, from, how we can get from A, meaning the current situation, uh, 27 member states, next year it will be 28 member states of the Union, uh, and coming from there to a situation where we can say, this is a single integrated digital market with unified services, everybody can access those services in the same manner as you are used it. Um, it's a difficult thing because uh, on the one hand competition authorities are very much focused on keeping the competition in their markets alive and at the same time 
somehow we have to move to that goal called single market. So uh, that is not that is not free from contradictions. There, there are a couple of breaking lines between these. You know? That's good. So let's see what we were talking. It's a how is these new technologies, these new generation networks? Do do, do you think? It really bring people together, or do you think we will be able? Uh, even uh, there, are like two walls, because you were talking more about uh, the mobile world, right? And the mobile world is it's very segmented. It's very uh, there's full of barriers and full of monopolies still in many countries of the world, uh, or oligopolies, two or three. Uh, but in the other hand. We have the internet technology, which is, uh, I would say, like it's the 3G uh, from and the Wi-Fi, right? So Wi-Fi, everything is open and they're regulated, and the other is more close and more. It's more business oriented. They they charge you for, for everything. You send an SMS in roaming and three euros, uh, which is still a little, <laughs> little expensive, right? And they are based and local based. If you imagine, why if I send an email? To Australia, it's the same that if I send it to Berlin from Berlin. Why, if I still do a digital call to Australia, it costs me a lot in cell phones. Uh, that's probably it's another debate. But if when we are talking about uh, these networks, I think it, it will have to be an approach of an internet approach because if it's a telco uh, approach or a, a, at least a, a cell phone company approach. It's going to be full of barriers and walled gardens. What What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, as the person representing a carrier here, I, I agree with that. I, I agree with that. I mean, I guess this is a European perspective, but prices for for all connectivity connectivity services are coming down. You mentioned roaming; they didn't come down fast enough. And uh, I think, as an industry, we would all say well, that's but not uh, the industry that's because the the regulator said, okay, this is fifty yeah. percent discount from now. Yeah. They have to force it. And I, I think it's a blight on the reputation of the industry, frankly. It didn't happen fast enough and it should have happened. Uh, but, but prices will come down across, across the piece and it's being driven by competition. Um, and I think that will continue. Um, there still needs to be a business case to pay back, you know, to put LTE networks in, 4G, to invest in these technologies. You need to know that uh, as a business, the capital investment is going to have some payback. Uh, but increasingly, that payback is, is, is not just the connectivity and, and the billing on that. It's the services that come on top. It's the loyal relationships. But those costs will come down. And again, that's why I talked about, and I agree with you, that maybe one network per country, certainly in Europe, may not make sense because you need infrastructure-based competition. But in a small European country, to have five or six physical networks also is very, very economically inefficient. Um, in, in Kenya, there, uh, there is a a case where they just built one national network for 4G and then a number of, of licensed service providers on top of that network which is driving the cost down to, to the consumer. Additionally, by the way, with, with, with data, a huge amount of the data that consumers use is not on our network because they're on Wi-Fi and they're on other technologies which, which are free. So our, our business model as a carrier, and this is every carrier in the world, is going to have to find new revenue models. Just billing for access is an old paradigm. It's an old paradigm and it hasn't disappeared, but it is disappearing and will continue, I think, at an accelerating rate to disappear. I, uh, one, one brief comment on uh, networks and services. Uh, I think um, there will be no real global networks in that sense. It's always a combination of regional or national networks, but the uh, service delivery will become global, kind of... Uh, uh, I think there is a strong tendency towards um, uh, global kind of OTT over top delivered services uh, which have a similar uh, look and feel for the, for the customer uh, which cr I, in my view would create a, a global, a global um, uh, user experience which um, can be delivered over a couple of different networks and the customer will ultimately not care about the network anymore. Only, only the, the look and feel of the surface. Yeah, I mean, to some extent, I think that's already happened. There's lots of people that, to them, the internet is Facebook, and that's the beginning and the end of it. 
or Skype for free phone calls and and, and that sort of thing. Um, do you think that, I'm just curious, is, is over the top something that where we, where we need regulation as well as the regular network? And who regulates? <laughs> no, I, no, I think um, for the time being, um, we, we have a situation which, um, so to say, the traditional telcos complaining a lot uh, that they're facing unfair competition provided by the OTTs. And um, I mean, one could say, okay, why have the telcos simply missed that OTT possibility? Why have they all left it over to companies all sitting in, the, in North America? Um, so that's an interesting question. However, if you look uh, from, a, from a regulatory standpoint at it, I would say there is a lack of level playing field between OTTs and telcos. And um, I mean, OTTs are not regulated at all. I mean, if you want to use a service from Apple or Google or Skype, if you want to use it, you have to tick, I agree to the terms and conditions, and that's it. Um, telcos are subject to uh, regulatory scrutiny in each and every member state in the, in, in the union. Um, and so regulation for telcos is here, and for OTTs it's here. So. I think there could be a future where they meet somewhere here. And then I, I, I think yeah. just to add a comment, I, I think uh, uh, my view and our view, I guess, as a company, would be over-the-top services are taking, you know, they're driving down prices, they're driving people off of our network, and that's simply a fact. It's a reality, and. Our focus has to be to provide similar services. So we're providing over-the-top services that compete with our own build services. So, you know, um, WhatsApp, Viba, we've launched our own similar free-to-the-user service based on those same models. Because trying to put your head in the sand and say, well, these guys shouldn't be doing it or throw more regulation at them or find a way for them to be build more money to use our network to provide those services, I, I think those are arguments that, that may make you feel better, but is it not going to stop the onslaught of the internet? And the onslaught of the internet is people will create and innovate and find better and cheaper and more diverse ways of communicating, which is a good thing. Uh, and if there's a better and cheaper way than we're providing it, that's a good thing as well. And it means we have a wake up call to innovate just as fast. It's one of the reasons why we're here at Campus Party, because we need to be thinking not like an operator in the telco, but thinking in a different way. And uh, it's an uncomfortable thing because we have parts of our business that are giving away for free, according to the over-the-top model, the stuff that we're selling over there. And that built-in conflict, I think, is the only way to approach innovation because you're not going to stop it. And if you try to stop it, you're foolish. But, but, but the interesting point is, uh, you, you mentioned people are leaving your network when using an OTT. I mean, they are on your network, but they don't, I mean, they don't know it because they're using the service from somebody else who is delivering this service on top of your network. The point is, um, what, what, what can you do uh, to get a better situation uh, or more, more fair, balanced situation between those um, two spheres? And there is a lot of, uh, I would say, fuss around this because nobody knows about all these peering agreements and who pays whom what on the wholesale level. It's an extremely, extremely opaque situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there's OTT that is in eating up huge bandwidth, um, and there, there's some services that are not. Things like YouTube or services like that that are owned by huge corporations are using a huge amount of, you know, of our network bandwidth, uh, and that's important because it's degrading maybe the experiences of other paying customers. Do I think they should be paying some or part of the cost of the networks which they're benefiting from? Yes, I, I, I do. Uh, and I think there needs to be a different model for peering so that some of these huge content providers are maybe paying some of the peering cost. But I think that's slightly different from OTT services, which uh, uh, it, it, uh, you could argue that you pay according to your usage, right? The, the more the, 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 the network that you use, the more you pay. But that's not how the internet is set up. And I guess I'm interested in your view, Paul, because I, I think charging everybody for for peering into the internet is, is, is a very different way of looking at the way the internet works. Mm -hmm. So 
Let's talk a little bit on how do you foresee the, the future? The future, I mean, to be able to, to connect all these new people who are offline, how do you see like more wired networks, wireless networks, a combination? Um, I would say there is a virtuous circle that says that when you connect somebody, uh, as more people you connect in that country, of course, prices go down and then you can add more people to the network, then these people create services, those services uh, attract to other people, more people come over and the prices go down. That means it's a, a virtuous circle of the internet. If not, you can see, uh, compare the prices, the wholesale internet prices in different countries, and you will see as more, there is a, a very straight correlation among people who are connected, number, penetration rates in that country, and prices. Uh, it's, 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 it, it's, it's pretty normal, but, but the idea, do you think that this virtuous circle applies to the end? I mean, probably in developed countries this happened, but not, uh, there are some countries and some parts of countries that get out of this formula, right? Uh, still, uh, and, and I think these are the, the challenges that to, to connect all these people. Uh, sometimes we were talking previously to this conversation that uh, the telco approach doesn't, doesn't work. Doesn't work uh, if you think in some villages in Africa, and not in Africa, in Germany, that where the people are scattered, uh, you know, in rural areas, the telco will be the last one who will <laughs> provide services there, right? Then some uh, public approach could, could, could work better. But uh, which are the, uh, from your point of view, uh, the most difficult, uh, well, the, the, the threats that, the, that can, should be avoided to be as fast as possible to connect everybody in the world? To, to connect, to, to connect, connect all these people. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I think telcos can't be the only solution. So if you're talking about remote parts of Africa that are not economic uh, to connect, the, the new models have to develop, and we're seeing this develop. I mean, there's a, there's a project called Geeks Without Frontiers, which is a more of a philanthropic approach to getting uh, villages connected, getting the last mile, using Wi-Fi type technologies, using a combination of, of public and private money, money from corporations. Um, I think you need a collaborative approach, so I mean, listening to Don Tapscott and this idea that the, that the internet is the most powerful platform for collaboratively solving problems that ever existed, um, I, I think you need some group thinking about how to come up with some of those solutions. You know, you and I had a, had a lunch yesterday and you were talking about farmers in, in Catalonia who were just rolling out their own fiber and buying it off the shelf and rolling it out and peering into the internet because... Um, you know, they, they couldn't get high-speed connectivity in any other way. You know, so I think these, that, that's not a solution that's going to apply in rural Africa, but there'll be other solutions that, that the telcos and the carriers aren't the ones that come up with. They'll be come up with by creative, innovative people. But the barrier isn't technology. I think these technologies now exist. The barrier is money, as always. And if there's no commercial return to be made, it's not reasonable to expect that commercial companies are necessarily going to, to invest. But, but there are other models, and some of them haven't evolved yet. But we're seeing lots of signs of, you know, in rural regions where community-based internet, mobile will help because mobile is a cheaper technology to roll out, particularly when, you know, the, the number of connections will increase and, and the business model will change. But again, 20 billion interconnected mobile devices, you know, by, by 2020 uh, will drive a different economics as to, to what it costs to build out to rural regions. But I think telcos won't have the answer and we're looking to telcos for all the answers uh, I think will frustrate, frustrate everybody. Yeah, I, I, I guess when I look at this, it's, it's, I think that probably some form of usage-based pricing is inevitable because part of the reason for that is that, well, if I'm not paying for usage, then, and if I want to buy a new iPad, I can just sit there and program my machine to just go around to all the vendors trying to find when they have the cheapest price. I'll just sit there and continuously pull. Um, if I'm a stock trader, I can just sit there looking for arbitrage opportunities. And if there's no volume cost, 
then I can think of infinite ways to chew up that bandwidth which have lower and lower marginal utility. So I think there's probably some usage-based pricing that makes sense in the future. The thing that I don't think makes any sense at all is, is that I pay more for a bit of movie than one bit of music or one bit of voice or one bit of email. And that's the trend that I think is pretty weird where you say that I'm going to look at the the type of the, I mean, I can believe that I have to pay per megabit, but that the price per megabit of voice, movie, etc., should probably be the same. What do you think? I agree. I agree. I think pricing ought to be uh, independent of the content. It doesn't matter what content you're consuming, but, but you pay for the content. You pay for the connectivity. Which is I, not, I absolutely agree. Which is not the case right now. Uh, like. Uh, factors of 10 of difference in depending on the, what country, uh, but the bits have the same color <laughs> on the world. But it depends on which country you're in. So I live in the UK and our pricing in the UK is you get X amount of data for uh, X price uh, and beyond that it's, it's, it's per megabit. So it doesn't matter what you use it for. You've paid for that, there's no restriction. No one says you can't watch films which, because they're bandwidth hungry. No one says you can't do which this. Which can thing. get very expensive then if you go well, over it, the limit. Yeah. 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 But you, then yeah. you have a pricing model to, to cover that. Yeah. We've also put in to ensure that people don't get caught out. So as soon as they go over the limit, they'll, they'll be texted when they're over. Yeah. They'll be blocked if they go over 50 yeah. pounds in the UK example. They we can, won't let them go any further so they're not surprised by watching a movie and they get the bill shot. Uh, and this is evolving quickly. It's evolving quickly because people have uh, so many bandwidth hungry uh, needs and that's pushing the price down and down because you know there's competition amongst networks and you need to innovate to, to win the hearts and minds of the consumer. Yes, but I, I was asking a little bit more about the threats, that the, the, the problems, the stoppers that you can see uh, not to, to, to see this goal uh, achieved, the goal to connect everybody, right? What, what do you think? It's, are the, the, the biggest uh, stoppers that, that could be important you know, to address globally. I guess, I, I guess you can tell from my tone I'm quite optimistic. Uh, I, I think the next billion and the one after that will come much more quickly uh, than the billion before. Um, I think the biggest, the, the barrier is, is you know, the, the inherent inequality between the rich and poor worlds and the extent to which connectivity to, to the global internet, connectivity to all of the huge benefits because, I mean, you walk around campus party, the business case is, is so absolutely clear in terms of education, knowledge, changing health systems, changing, you know, changing everything. Um, the, 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 big, the biggest barrier, I think, is, is, is more political. You know, it's the will of, you know, of countries. I mean, I asked a number of people how optimistic or pessimistic they felt about this. You know, people were very pessimistic about uh, corruption in some developing countries, uh, about lack of political will, uh, about lack of a clear roadmap and a plan uh, coming from governments, coming from regulators, coming from international bodies. But they were not pessimistic about the technology which exists. They weren't pessimistic about the power of people to come up with solutions if allowed. So I think some of the biggest barriers are, are, are man-made, are, are, are political more than technological. Any other views and the stoppers and the problems that can be in the middle of this goal? I, I would like to focus a little bit on Europe. I think um, the challenge we have is um, besides strengthening the demand side and uh, helping or enabling the user uh, to, to create a proper demand answer, so to say, to the supply, um, is to raise the money for making an investment. Uh, I mean, the price tag is approximately between 300 to 500 billion for Europe to roll out Europe-wide new generation access network. So the problem is where, where does the money comes from? And we have intensive competition in Europe and prices went down over time, over time, um, and uh, the, the financial um, situation of many operators is in a difficult situation. So uh, the question is where the money comes from. I do not see a similar situation as to Australia where the uh, uh, national broadband uh, plan have 
brought the, the network back to the state and, and the federal state is going to finance it. So the, uh, the operators need um, pricing, some pricing flexibility um, and that leads me to the question, okay, what about net neutrality? Because uh, if you start to introduce different service classes, say, okay, for a managed service, introducing, uh, including this and that service, like a video service or whatsoever, you name it, um, I would charge more and then you get uh, prioritized traffic. The question is uh, how that can be made um, transparent and fair vis-a-vis -vis the end user. And um, I mean, my, my, my stance is um, if operators want to introduce uh, the golden last mile, uh, that's okay, but there should be four conditions kept. So one is uh, transparency, uh, what, uh, what is offered, free choice between managed and unmanaged service. Number three would be a minimum set of requirements for the unmanaged service, otherwise it would go somewhere and finally tools for the customer to measure whether they get what they paid for. Um, and I think under these conditions uh, it is possible to make those differentiations and maybe we will we'll get there ultimately. Yeah. But you are entering in a very difficult thing, right? In the, well, when, when you allow to the, the carriers to distinguish in different qualities and services, we are talking about net neutrality, all these debates that has been all the past months, uh, and, and, and maybe in a regulated uh, market this is good, but when you started doing this, uh, sometimes this can be used for other purposes, right? uh, you know, for censorship, depending on the countries. You, you were based on Europe, which is yes. probably not, yes. not the I'm, case. I'm, not I was now speaking of Europe, and uh, I mean, of course, I, I, once I said, uh, starting this debate or I mean starting to differentiate different service classes is opening Pandora box in a way yeah uh, and I think that is true uh, however we have we have the challenge how these new generation networks will be financed at the end you know? yes, that's a big a big issue and do you think it's also a big issue in America or you see it more in Europe uh, well you know, when people talk about network neutrality, I don't see much. This reminds me of, you know, Carl Sagan would study alien life from other planets and he had no examples to study. I think network neutrality oh, is a bit like that. You, you have the debate now on, on uh, FaceTime. Oh yeah, no, no, there's certainly a debate about network neutrality. I just don't believe any of it exists. I, I, I just don't see any examples of it. And, you know, when you talk about, uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, video service yeah. and that regulation and whether or not you have to have a limited or unlimited plan, that just proves my point that network neutrality doesn't really seem to exist. A friend of mine that's a regulator and works in the securities industry for the government in the U.S. and the SEC, he says there's no such thing as a, as a level playing field. There's just markets that all of the players are trying to distort differently. And that, you know, I'm trying to be kind of a referee and keep the competition within bounds. And I think that's what we need to do. And I think that in particular, when we think about regulation, we should be thinking as much at the higher levels of the Internet as we are about the cost per bit for video mail. Um, and I think it's just more a question of to what extent society wants to have its big thumb on that level playing field and trying to twist it to you know, serve its aims, and it's going to be a, a competition. I, I was happy to see Apple kind of, you know, moving to destroy the, uh, you know, the, the per message pricing by, well, we'll just send it as an internet packet for free when we can get away with that. Uh, they will only do that, I guess, probably for people that have iPhones, right, not people that have Androids. But, I mean, some of these things, that the technology is clearly going to, the, the messaging services are priced at such a wide variance from their cost that sooner or later that had to go away. Um, I just think we have to figure out how to try and accelerate it at all the levels of the protocol stack. Yeah, I, I, 
I think it's sometimes easier to have these, these conversations and forget that there's a customer at the end of the conversation and that customer has a lot of choice about where they take their business. So you're often presented with this idea that everyone has to have the same service and you can't have different qualities and levels of service for different price, which just feels insane to me. You know, in what other sector would you dictate that everybody must behave in the same way? You know, have a lower quality service for a lower price, have a bigger pay. You know, that's called innovation. That that's uh, that's competition. And if you're not a monopoly, then there shouldn't be any concern about having different levels of pricing. In terms of net neutrality, I think it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, and people get very, very confused about what it does and doesn't mean, including me sometimes, because I see it used, I think every which way. I think our view would would, would be that. You know, when you talk, George, about the, the billions of costs to, to build these networks, which provide enormous public good, these networks, um, our view is they probably should be shared amongst those who, who reap the most benefit from those networks. And oftentimes, there, there's an enormous amount of content that isn't being, you know, that, 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 that is using up that capacity, isn't being paid for. And I think we should look at other models because it's in the public good, because there will be uh, the opportunity to create a better investment case for more networks and it will reach more people. Perfect. We have five minutes more to, to, to take questions and ideas or whatever you want to say from our public. So can, can we have a microphone here, please? Can we have a microphone? I have to say that one of the things I find really odd here is that we're talking about these issues where I bet down at the entrepreneur's booth, they're saying, well, the first thing you need to have for your business is an unfair advantage. And you want to have a moat. You know, you, 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 all the things that we're talking about shouldn't be there are the first principles for entrepreneurs. Having an unfair view. If you go to Silicon Valley and present to a VC, what's your, mo what's your unfair advantage? What's the barrier to entry for competition? Those are all the things that the entrepreneurs are looking for that we're looking at eliminating here. And I just find it peculiar. But, but you should not forget, these rules are only apply for market dominant companies and and a startup is normally not market dominant. Good, good answer. So do you guys have some questions or some ideas to share with us? I think you should share the microphone. Right, I have to share this. Thanks. Any question or, or idea? Over there? Yes. We have one question there. Thanks. Hi, I just, um, I'm sitting here in the audience and I hear, I've been, you know, kind of bringing all this through my head and thinking about the future, the internet, the grid. Um, this is no longer a luxury. This is our lives. These, we can't live without, without being connected. We can't live without, um, you know, our, not just our phones, but you know what you were saying, Paul, before about being everything's being uh, your toasters talking to your refrigerator. You know, it's a point where we can't live without this. So to me, I hear you talking about you know the big telcos and stuff, uh, talking about you know uh, uh, managing the grid or managing the uh, the internet uh, access. And I think, um, in my impression, that this is is going to be something that's that's needed, like the the electric grid. And it's not going to be something that is a luxury anymore. So I see almost the future of is really going to be the electric company and not being, you know, a, a, a company that brings a lots of services. So I don't know, I mean, I know te Telefonic is not going to be happy about me saying that, but I, I don't know how you see that, if there's barriers to that, but I see this becoming a, a utility um, rather than something that adds a lot of, um, you know, value-added kind of thing. And as other things progress, I see them becoming utilities. I think that's just the natural progression as you become so big and so so important and so uh, ubiquitous. You become, a, a, you know, a need versus a, a luxury, a want. I don't know if you want to comment on that at all. I agree, and I think someone mentioned it is almost a basic human right, uh, and I agree. I mean, we said before, 20 to 50 billion, you know, connected devices, six million people, six billion people um, connected through mobile, and the vast majority of those are going to have internet connectivity, 
and the vast majority will be some sort of a smartphone, which are now coming down in price to you know, the $40, $50 range and probably lower. So the, the base case, as you say, is a utility. I mean, that's the, the base case of just providing connectivity is what telcos do, and that is the utility bit, and that, that those prices do come down through competition and through technological change that makes it cheaper. It, it's then up to you to fight it out in the market to who's got the, the, the most useful services that people will buy for, or really people will pay for. But, but that kind of getting everybody connected uh, is the starting point. Okay, so, so I do we agree. should wrap up the conversation already, and we have been talking about the future, about how to connect all these five billion people that still are offline, which are the threats that uh, can be found in this way to, to connect them all, all the humanity. And well, the last thing I have to say is uh, thank you very much to all of you. It has been a really interesting conversation, and thanks for, for being here. Thank you.